Welcome to Data Center Energy Efficiency Opportunities, What Managers Should Know, brought to you by US EPA's Energy Star Program. I'm Bob Wong with the Cadmus Group, and I'll be presenting Part 4, Opportunities to Save Energy with HVAC and Humidity Adjustments. If you walk into your data center and find it's noticeably colder than the rest of the building, chances are good that you can save energy with some HVAC adjustments. Fifteen to twenty years ago, you could walk into a data center and put on your coat. That's because we thought servers needed to operate at lower temperatures. In 2008, ASHRAE recommended increasing server inlet temperatures rather dramatically. Turns out that modern data center equipment can handle much higher temperatures than we previously imagined. That means it's not necessary to cool data centers as much. And just like at home, you can save 3 to 5 percent of energy costs for every one degree you increase the thermostat temperature. ASHRAE recommends you measure the, and record temperature and humidity at the geometric center of the air intake of the top, middle, and bottom of racked equipment at about 2 inches from the front of the equipment. This is shown in the diagram to your right and helps ensure you don't miss hot spots on racks. On the last slide, we ask that you turn up the heat in your data center. And this slide is showing you why you can do that. It's because today's servers and other equipment are built for hot environments. On this slide, we show you four different types of data center equipment. A Sun Blade server, a Dell Blade server, an IBM Blade server, and a storage unit from NetApp. Note that in all cases, the inlet temperatures of 90 degrees and higher are acceptable operating ranges for these pieces of equipment. So let's talk about raising server inlet temperatures. As with other opportunities to save energy in the data center, there's some things to consider before you raise the server inlet temperatures. The first thing is that temperatures should be raised very gradually and racks monitored closely for hot spots. Hot spots are areas of excessive heat that could cause equipment to fail. In this infrared photo taken from the front of a server rack, a hot spot is developed in the opening underneath one of the servers. A blanking panel might have helped here. Also, you don't want to raise room temperatures to such an extent that the internal server fans turn on automatically, as this can actually raise your energy costs. It's also worth noting that data centers with variable speed drives benefit the most from increasing temperatures, as fans don't have to work as hard. And lastly, most server rooms can't be so hot that humans can't enter and work in them. So when raising temperatures, make sure the hot aisle is at a reasonable working temperature. So let's talk about humidity control in the past in data centers. And first of all, why do we care about humidity in data centers? Well, if humidity is too high, we worry about moisture condensing on metal components inside servers, leading to shorts and equipment failure. If too low, we worry about static electricity discharging and damaging sensitive electrical equipment. And a typical data center uses a great deal of energy maintaining humidity through multiple crack units. Each crack unit has the ability to humidify, dehumidify, heat, and cool. And in the past, there were very tight relative humidity tolerances. So when the humidity gets too high, for instance, crack unit number one will subcool the air to remove moisture and then reheat, typically using electric resistance heat to maintain space temperature. Due to the actions of crack number one, Nearby crack number two reads the humidity is too low and raises the humidity by using inefficient steam canister humidifiers and cools air to bring temperatures back down. Crack number one will then react to the actions of crack number two and the entire cycle begins again. This cycle is known as crack fighting and leads to enormous waste in data centers.
So how do we go about solving these humidity issues? Well, there are a number of ways. Uh, the first is to change the humidity setting on the crack unit to dew point instead of relative humidity. B and Y Mellon change their humidification set points from relative humidity, which varies by temperature, to dew point, which is an absolute measure of humidity, to reduce humidification runtime from 80% to 20% of the time to save enormous amounts of energy. Another way to go about solving the humidity issue is by broadening the humidity range. We've learned that servers don't require the tight humidity range as we used to think. In fact, ASHRAE recommends a broad range of humidity from 42 degrees Fahrenheit dew point to 59 degrees Fahrenheit dew point. And lastly, if you are going to humidify your data center, you should use adiabatic humidification technologies. Old humidification technologies relied on heat to produce steam, a very energy intensive process. Newer adiabatic humidification technologies use mechanical means to produce water vapor. Misters, foggers, and ultrasonic units all fall under the adiabatic humidification technology category. These technologies are so efficient that California Title 24 actually requires adiabatic humidification in all new data centers being built in California. So let's look at an ultrasonic humidification retrofit uh, performed by eBay. Um, eBay was good enough to share some of their information from one of their smaller data centers in Arizona where they were replacing a steam humidifier with an ultrasonic humidifier. And the first thing I want you to take a look at is the actual power draw of these two different units. The steam humidifier draws 30.3 kilowatts while the ultrasonic humidifier draws only 0.67 kilowatts. So there's an order of magnitude difference between the power draws of these two units needed to produce this, the humidification for this eBay data center. And if you look at the numbers and look at the, the energy savings and the, the cost, both labor and the humidifier purchases, you can see that the payback is less than two years before utility incentives. And with the utility incentive, the payback is an astounding half year. Now, one thing we need to make you aware of is this study did not account for the cost of a water treatment unit uh, needed to make the deionized water required of ultrasonic humidifiers. eBay already had one. So let's talk about free cooling with a water side economizer. In large data centers, you often have a chiller uh, with refrigerant, a compressor, that provides a continuous supply of chilled water for use in air handling units that provide cool air to the data center. A water-cooled chiller uses condenser water to take away the heat gained in the refrigerant, condensing the refrigerant from a gas to a liquid. The condenser water is then cooled in an evaporative cooling tower. However, when it's cold and dry enough outside, the condenser water can be used to cool the chilled water directly through a heat exchanger or a water side economizer, and the chiller can be bypassed. This map shows how many hours per year it's actually cold and dry enough outside to use free cooling, the water side economizer, in most of the U.S., data centers could use free cooling with a waterside economizer for half the year or more. However, there's problems with the waterside economizer as a retrofit in that it's very expensive to retrofit a data center with a waterside economizer, and it may only make financial sense for new data center construction. In fact, in California, under Title 24, all new data centers are required to use a water side economizer. Another huge benefit of the water side economizer is an added level of security in case the chiller breaks down. So if your chiller breaks down, you can use the water side economizer to keep your data center cool.
Let's talk about another type of free cooling uh, with an air side economizer. Um, an air side economizer simply uses outside air to cool the data center. In certain climates, such as San Francisco, this is possible for most of the year. However, there are some issues with using outdoor air to cool your data center directly, as you might imagine. Humidity is one concern. Outdoor air can be very cool, but can be very dry. In addition, outside air may need to be filtered to remove contaminants and particulate matter that could harm delicate electronics. One final note, like the water side economizer, the air side economizer represents an added level of security in case mechanical cooling breaks down. So once again, let's look at the hours of air side economizer potential use per year by looking at a map of temperatures across North America. And what this map really is, is the number of available hours where the dry bulb temperature is below 81 degrees and the dew point is below 59 degrees. In other words, when the air is cool and dry enough to use it to directly cool your data center. And what you notice in this map, which I find astounding, is that even, even in northern Florida, you can use free cooling, an airside economizer, for nearly half the year. One final note on airside economization is that free cooling is being used in some of the largest data centers currently being built in the world. They're relying 100% on free cooling with no mechanical cooling at all. For example, Microsoft built a facility in Dublin that uses only airside economizers. Yahoo built its chicken coop data center in upstate New York that also relies 100% on outdoor air for cooling with absolutely no chillers, no mechanical cooling at all. So that concludes part four of our presentation on data center energy efficiency opportunities, what managers should know. Once again, my name's Bob Wong. I'm with the Cadmus Group. Please feel free to contact me with any additional questions. My contact information is shown on this slide. Also, if you'd like to know what else Energy Star can do for you in the green IT space, please go to the website, www.energystar.gov forward slash low carbon IT.